Will Appleton with an episode of Chatter for November 6, 2022. For today's episode, the team at Lawfare decided to cross-post this week's episode of Chatter, a podcast hosted by David Priest that features in-depth discussions with fascinating people at the creative edges of national security. Today's episode of Chatter is entitled Cryptography in History and in the Movies with Vince Hoden. In the episode, David Priest traveled to the National Cryptologic Museum to meet with the museum's director, Vince Hoden. While walking around the museum, they discussed the origins of some of the museum's unusual items, the value of having them on display, traded views on movies incorporating ciphers and codes, and more. This is Chatter. Welcome to Chatter. I'm David Priest, publisher of Lawfare. This week, museum director and historian Vince Houghton on cryptography in history and in the movies. To me, museums are inspirational. Right? You can be educated by going and reading a book or watching a documentary. You can be entertained by watching Netflix. Museums should cause you to want to know more about the world around you. It was insanely difficult to break Enigma. This was not something that was done in two hours. This was something that was done over years. And it wasn't just Turing and four other guys sitting in a room going, Eureka, Heil Hitler, we found it. It was thousands of people working on this. If you want the public to understand things, and the public wants to understand things, you got to present it to them in a way that is not dumbed down. Vince Houghton, welcome to Chatter. Nice to be here. Thanks, David. Yeah, it's nice to be here. Here is the National Cryptologic Museum, right outside the boundaries of the National Security Agency in Maryland. Thanks for hosting us. Oh, we love to have you guys here. Thanks. And what we're going to do for at least uh, the first half or so of this episode is walk around the museum look at some artifacts, because this is a, a new museum, and you're going to talk a little bit about that, how you did it, why you did it, and talk about the history of cryptology through these artifacts, and not only get people interested in the museum itself, but also dig in a little bit to what we know and what we don't know about codes, code breaking, and everything else involved in cryptology. So before we start, just a little bit for everybody else about why you're here, what you're doing with the museum, and, and why this is different than it would have been a few years ago. Yeah, when we opened on uh, October 8th, uh, so just a little while ago, uh, we talked about it as a grand opening versus a reopening. And mainly, even though the museum's been around since the early 90s, uh, we, we took the opportunity during COVID to strip it down to the studs, uh, both physically, uh, but also you know, ideologically, the idea, we, we thought what we wanted to do with a museum kind of from the very beginning. And the great part is we have all the great, wonderful assets that NSA has collected over the last 70 years. And right. even before that, their predecessor agencies. So we have ridiculously cool art. I mean, I'm a nerd. I have ridiculously cool artifacts uh, that we're able to put on display in some cases for the first time ever. Uh, because during the COVID lockdown, some stuff became declassified that no one had ever seen before. We can talk about that. But we also have the opportunity to go through every single artifact we have in our collection, which no museum ever gets a chance to do. Uh, but because we didn't have visitors, we had the time to do it. And, and we found stuff that we didn't know we had. We actually found stuff that no one knew existed, uh, which again is, is about as nerdy as you can get when it comes to uh, the history of intelligence and, uh, and learning things through objects, which is really what museums are all about. Now, that is fascinating, especially to hear you say it, because you are a, a student of intelligence history. You've written, you've got two books published already on different aspects of military and intelligence history. But you came to this job from being the historian and curator of the International Spy Museum in Washington, which is has no shortage of great artifacts too. But coming here, you're saying you found things that you didn't even know were in existence in the deep dark vaults of the previous National Cryptologic Museum. Well, the, the cool thing about the Spy Museum is it's so broad. Right, it covers all aspects of intelligence work from collection to analysis to dissemination to covert action, and everything in between. And they do have a codes and cipher space, but it's relatively small, not much there. 
that is our really deep dive. So we basically, our mission is to focus on American cryptologic history and only American cryptologic history. So while they're doing all sorts of cool stuff when it comes to spies and CIA and NGA and everybody else, we are primarily focused on a specific thing. So there's a big difference, right? You go there for the big broad overview. You come here if you really want to get knee deep or maybe even chest deep in some of these cryptologic stories. And so, yeah, we have artifacts that they could only dream of having uh, because we are NSA uh, and we have, you know, a warehouse full of stuff that NSA has collected over the last 70 years. And, and before that, SIS and OP20G and all these other agencies that turned into NSA. And so these are things that you can't see anywhere else. I think that's, that's the important part is we know where we are. We're in the Washington DC metro area and we have to compete with everybody. Right. We're competing with the spy museum, the Smithsonian's, all the things to do, all the places to go. And we're not necessarily on the national mall, right? Which would be great because tourists could just walk in. You gotta make a point to come here, but we gotta, we gotta convince people there's a reason to come to this museum. And so we, we really kind of thought that way. We said, okay, what's gonna make us a destination? What's gonna force people to say, I gotta go to that museum. And it's putting stuff on display you just can't see anywhere else. And that, that was our primary focus. Well, let's get into that and see some of these things that we can't see anywhere else and get the stories behind them. So the museum's not very big. I think people will, will walk in and go, oh, this is you know not a huge museum. We're certainly, again, not the size of any of the stuff you'd find in Washington. But the space we use, we use it well. Uh, we have three main galleries. Uh, when you come in, Gallery 1 is, is focused kind of on a chronological history from the American Revolution all the way through the Second World War. Okay. Our second gallery does more thematic elements, the revolution in computers, uh, linguistics and language analysis, analysis as a kind of a cryptographic focus, too, of breaking down languages, understanding nuance and slang and all the right. things that kind of, it's not necessarily codes, but we, we have to think of it that way as more of a not collection idea, but a more of between collection and analysis, the idea of, you know, code breaking is in that space between collection and analysis, you know, the, you're manufacturing intelligence from data. Language analysis falls into that too as well. I do want to get into that uh, later as well when we talk about language and cryptology, because for so many people who didn't already experience it, the imitation game, yeah. the movie about Alan Turing, really brought out that linguists and mathematicians were very different when it came to cryptology. And I, and I think it did a disservice in some ways there, but we'll talk about that as we go Absolutely. through. And then we have a gallery we call Gallery 3, which is focused on the defensive side. Right. So everything here is about code breaking and kind of the offensive part of what the agency does and what other agencies do. And then we have a gallery that people don't realize necessarily that NSA does, which is protect information. Yeah. So it's, it's great if you can go collect information from other countries and adversaries by breaking their codes, but if you can't protect your own, it really doesn't matter. So NSA does a lot of work there, uh, and that we really focus on that kind of what we used to call information assurance. Uh, it's got new terminology now, but essentially the defensive side. As we make our way to our first uh, artifact, tell me a little bit about your ideal audience for the museum, because we, we've talked about museum and curation on the podcast before with others related to the 9-11 museum and others related to that event, and there's multiple purposes for any museum. There's audiences, there's what messages are you saying, what messages aren't you saying, because you have limited space and limited bandwidth for anyone coming through. So, so talk about your main goals for the museum on top of what you've said already, um, especially to set up the artifact. So this is a really long conversation, but I'll simplify it down to a kind of a foundation. Um, there's a lot of debate in museum world whether a museum should be educational or entertaining. Right. Uh, people talk about infotainment or, you know, or what I, whenever we go to museum conferences and there's one every year and it's like, you think of the nerdiest conference on the planet, but, um, I'm usually the one in the back when this argument's happening, uh, yelling neither. And then everyone giving me dirty looks <laughs> to me, museums are inspirational, yeah. All right, You can be educated by going and reading a book or watching a documentary. You can be entertained by watching Netflix. Museums should cause you to want to know more about the world around you to regardless of what they are. My goal ultimately is for our visitors to have more questions walking out the door than they had walking in the door. Mm -hmm. I want them to go, I never thought of that. I never kind so it's of- to begin like a road of exploration. For yeah, them. and that's why our labels are short. That's why we're not, our walls are not plastered with information. There are 5,000 books out there about Enigma. I'm not gonna put one of them on the wall. I want to inspire someone that's never really heard of it or someone that doesn't know a lot about it to go, you know what, I wanna go, I wanna know more about this. 
And that's really what we're trying to do here. So that's what our artifacts are. Our artifacts are the ones we chose are an attempt to push that narrative. That's why our labels are short to kind of give people a little bit of a spark to try to push them toward for, you know, learning more as they go along and whether they're gonna read a book or take a class or watch a documentary, all those things we want to send them off on their way doing. And then we wanna make sure that people are inspired by seeing the real thing. Mm. So there's not a right. single reproduction on display here oh. at the National Cryptologic Museum. So everything we're going to see is the real thing. 100% of wow. our artifacts are real. Now, okay. there's also something I believe in called the Holy Trinity of artifacts <laughs> where my goal is to get to 100% of our artifacts that fall within one or more of three categories. The only one of something, the first of something, or something used by a specific person or a specific historical event. We're at about 85% of the artifacts on display are the one. We're gonna to get to 100 eventually, we're not quite there yet, but everything's real and vast majority of the artifacts are going to be something you cannot see anywhere else. That's great. Okay, so what are we gonna look at first? Describe what we're, we're seeing and I'll add my own reaction to it as we first look at it. So we, we randomly walked into our gallery two, which has multiple spaces. One, it focuses on the computer revolution. So you're working from the Second World War uh, where uh, particular cryptic machines from the Germans were when I able to be broken using straightforward means, even the means that you saw in like the imitation game, yeah. like, you know, bombs and large machines. So the, the British create the first computer which is Colossus. So we have a piece of Colossus here in the museum, it came from GCHQ, from our friends over in Great Britain. Uh, and then we walk our way around the room focusing on this evolution of computer technology from some of the early computers at NSA, um, Abner, Harvest, these are ones we're going back into the 40s, 50s, 60s, mm -hmm. to the first ever desktop computer, which is the Pace 10, to some of the largest supercomputers where you're looking at moving into the 80s and 90s and even 2000s, and you're going from very analog, slow processing that is destroyed by our iPhone or pocket, to things that are doing multiple billions of calculations in nanoseconds. Right. I'm gonna, I'm gonna stop you there for a second because I wanna go back to this Colossus. So it says here that the Colossus was from 1943, a British engineer designed it to try to break the cipher being used by Hitler's uh, high command. Now, my very distant memory, probably something you told me years ago, was that the Poles were using early bomb machines to try to decrypt German communications uh, in the late 1930s, I thought. So is Colossus really the first computer? And how do you describe the first computer used for this and compare it to others? So the bombs that were used to break Enigma were essentially just really, really fast computing machines. Now, mm -hmm. we're using the word computer and computing in sure. kind of different ways. What we define as a computer is that next step where you're talking about things like programmability. So the bomb was designed for one purpose and one purpose only, yeah. right? Plus, It they just had, cranked away and cranked, cranked away, but it didn't actually move forward based on programming. Right, so you're basically looking at a machine that's just doing math and, and you know, basic fundamental number crunching just really, really fast and doing it much faster than humans can do themselves. That's the bomb, okay. right? When you're talking about computers, like we say here, you're looking at not only storage capabilities, but programmability. And when we talk about storage, you're talking about memory. So that's the kind of difference that you're shifting from to Colossus and things like ENIAC and UNIVAC and the, okay. the actual quote unquote computers, you know, right. with a capital C okay. if you want to use that, that Fair come point. later on. And then the, when we talk about supercomputers, now we're talking about machines that are half the size of a room, or if you live <laughs> in places in DC, it's the size of your entire apartment uh, that are doing billions or not trillions of calculations per nanosecond. Uh, we have uh, here what we call the Frostberg, which is on display. It's big, it's honking, it's got blinky lights. Uh, the blinky lights actually are only there because the uh, it's so quiet compared to earlier computers that the engineers didn't think it was working. So they actually added blinky lights to know that it was working. Yeah. So the blinky lights serve no purpose whatsoever. Other that than seems like a that seems like a very Hollywood thing to do, and yet I'm looking at it. Blinky lights simply for the sake of making us feel good that it's doing its job. Yeah, it looks like the Whopper from War Games, right? The idea is it's got these lights that they do nothing. All they're doing is showing that it's computing. And it was because people were afraid it wasn't. Uh, much of the same, I guess, think about adding noise to like electric cars because people are worried that you don't know if they're on or they're running to people. And then a very famous manufacturer of supercomputers is Seymour Cray. Uh, the yeah. Cray series of computers, I think most people have heard of them. 
uh, one of the earliest crays at NSA, mm -hmm. uh, and then one that was actually just retired here next to it, we call the Black Widow, the Black Cray, the XTS, that went to just a couple of years ago, working at, you know, doing now teraflops worth of computation. So the two crays that we are looking at here in the museum were actually used at NSA for oh, cryptologic research. That's why we have right? them, right? right? I mean, that, that we have all this stuff because it was passed down to us right. from NSA. So when something's retired, they reach out to us, they say, hey, look, we're either gonna get rid of this or you want it. Uh, we can declassify this if necessary. We can, what we call sanitize it, pull yeah. out anything that really could be problematic. And then it comes down here. Yeah, so every one of these machines on display was at one point at NSA doing yep. cryptologic work. Wow. Now it is also safe, I'm, I'm guessing it's safe to assume that being sanitized means even if someone were in this museum unaccompanied, unguarded, that there's nothing they would gain about current US capabilities because of this. I mean, the, these machines weigh tons, but if somehow someone's able to pick this up and take it home with them, there's nothing that they could get out of it. And that's really what we're talking about here. The idea of making it available for public view uh, regardless of anyone does to it or from it. A lot of it's pulling out some of the insides of things that are still proprietary, there's things that must still have memory on them. You gotta protect sources and methods here as, as you do everywhere else. Yeah, I'm guessing the uh, the storage of what these devices were used on decades ago, th that storage isn't in there anymore. Yes, and, it, yeah, and even if it was decades ago, it's still possible that there's a, a sources and methods issue because you know people, our adversaries then tend to be our adversaries now in a lot of different ways, and so we don't want them to know what we're up to. Got it. How fun is it for you? I'm, I'm sure it, with the rollout of the new museum recently, you've had some veterans of the NSA come in, people who worked here for decades and never really got to go back and look at the things they worked with. But there were probably people who came through here and looked at that and got a little teary-eyed, realizing they'd worked on that back in the mid 80s and they'd actually used that cray you have over there. As we get more and more capable of putting more recent things in the museum, we actually have much younger people coming over and going, I can't <laughs> believe something I worked on is in a museum now. Yeah. I think that's one of the benefits of being a technology museum, where our primary focus is on technology. Because stuff becomes obsolete so quickly, we can actually have more recent things on display than a lot of other places. That's a good point. I mean, I'll, you know, CIA has some very recent things on display, but no one can go to that museum, right? You actually have to hear anyone and can walk around off the street and see something that was just retired a couple of years ago because we're now four generations past that and it's become so obsolete that no one, our adversaries, friends, anyone else can gain any real useful information from it. I think you raise a good point. The CIA museum, um, I did as an alumni have the chance to go back and walk through it and it, it's very nice. It does a lot of things well. It has some artifacts that are one of a kind. It also does have a few current-ish things, like the model that was used for the uh, Zawahiri attack. And that's fine, but you can't see it as just a citizen wanting to learn some of the intelligence history of the United States. That's special about the National Cryptologic Museum, right? It's 100% special. I mean, even the museums that an average American can go to, like the FBI experience, get to jump through some hoops to get there, right? You gotta get, special permission to go, most everyone will get it, but there's a process, right? Literally, if you've got time to kill and you're driving up the Baltimore Washington Parkway, you can pop in without any reservations. We're completely open to the public when we're open. Got it. That, that's one of the key differences between this museum and, and everyone else within the IC. We're, we say this and, and get, we get pushback, but we'll say it with confidence. We're the only museum in the intelligence community that's 100% open to the public. So walking around the corner here, I am suddenly looking at something that looks like a typewriter, although a very unusual one, and then some kind of a machine with, uh, with dotted tape reel. And it says that this may have preserved humanity because it was involved in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Vince, walk us through this. Is, is this the actual hotline that was used in the Cuban Missile Crisis? Well, this is the hotline that becomes reality after the Cuban Missile Crisis. So uh -huh. basically, when everyone realized how close we had gotten to blowing the hell out of ourselves, there became a need for direct communication between uh -huh. Washington and Moscow. And the Hollywoodization of this is the red phone on the president's desk. That's not reality. Reality actually is teletype machines that were in Washington and Moscow and were able to communicate instantaneously that a, a line that was dedicated to them to pass in any information that had to be passed immediately. And the first time this was used was a test, but the first time it was used in reality was the Americans announcing the assassination of John F. Kennedy to mm. the Soviets, basically. Mm. Like, Kennedy was killed 
We're not going to start World War III over it, uh, but we wanted to let you know that's what's going on. And so um, we have artifacts from both sides of the hotline, from the Washington side and from the Moscow side. Uh, and these communicated directly during the entire Cold War, really. You're talking about post cold Cuban Missile Crisis all the way until the end of the Cold War in the late 1980s. Yeah, I think it's fascinating that you would think that you would use the teletype machine to communicate, even with your first test message, to communicate something like, you know, hey, we hope this goes well. Let's use this if we need to. No, the first message sent to the Soviet Union says, the quick brown fox jumped over the lazy dog's back one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, zero. Basically testing all of the numbers and letters. Now that's that's an English sentence. How did this work in terms of language? Did the Soviets respond in English from their end? No, they responded in Russian. And the expectation was that you would have somebody who was involved in the communication system yeah. between the Soviet Union and the United States that spoke Russian fluently. But you didn't you didn't want to run into issues where there was a translation snafu. Right. Uh, we know from history, one of the great examples of this is the, the Khrushchev, you know, banging his shoe, we will bury you. Uh, we took that as being this very belligerent statement when, if you looked at the nuance of the statement, he was saying the long tradition of history, the long process of, of Soviet communism will eventually overtake the West. <laughs> it wasn't that we're gonna nuke the hell out of you, it's that our system will eventually bury capitalism, yeah. you know, and that was something that, was not reported correctly. And so you get this very belligerent tone from Khrushchev when he didn't mean it that way. So you want to have people, and we'll talk about this, you know, language analysis, who understand idioms and, and slang and nuance and regional dialects and all these things mm -hmm. that go into correctly and analyzing language. Uh, because that's something that, if it's done badly, it could have real problematic repercussions. Absolutely. And I'll note that the the two machines on display here were part of that Washington Moscow hotline for almost 20 years. So people obviously knew what they were, had custody of them, but I'm looking at something over here near it that I can't even figure out what it is and it does look a little bit more odd. Tell me the story behind this, first of all, describe what we're looking at and then tell me the story behind it. Yeah, I don't even know how to describe it. It's cool looking. I think that's the best way to describe it. But <laughs> this was a um, an object that was in our warehouse for the last, now looking at 70 plus years. And no one really knew what it was. And I think people held onto it because it kind of looked neat and it was heavy as hell. It was very hard to get rid of. The thing weighs about 600 pounds. I'm guessing it's about three feet wide by about two or three feet tall. It's got a number of gauges, a lot of different handles on it a bunch of switches. It looks like something out of a Hollywood set for a James Bond movie, but but this is a real a real device. What did it do? So this is nicknamed the Russian fish. Uh, essentially, it was created by the Germans at the end of World War II to listen into Russian to Soviet communications on the Eastern Front. And the idea was that the Soviets had multiple ways of communicating, at least they thought securely. One was encryption, you know, basically encrypting their communication was just kind of a standard way, but this did it in a different way. So essentially what the, what the Soviets were doing is they were splitting their messages into nine different channels and sending them independently over nine channels. And then they have the ability to, to get them on the other end and then reassemble the message from the nine different channels into a coherent message. If you try to intercept this communication and you didn't intercept all nine channels and then put them all back together, all you got was static. Mm. Well, the Germans figured out how to do this. This machine actually it was able to intercept all those different channels, bring them back together to give a coherent message. So at the end of the war, they actually bury this to make sure it doesn't get captured. <laughs> they literally bury they it. They literally bury it. Um, but we find it. Uh, there are groups of soldiers on the Allied side who are going around trying to capture German technology, capture German scientists, uh, and they run into this machine. And then a nearby POW camp, they actually find people who had operated it. And they pulled them out of the camp. They said, show us. Mm -hmm. This went back uh, to the Allied side and very quickly was being used against the Soviets because they were still communicating mm -hmm. that way. The really interesting thing about this and the kind of the reason that this tends to potentially rewrite our knowledge and our history of this time period is the prevailing wisdom about signals intelligence against the Soviets was that in 1948, there was a day in which the Soviets changed all of their codes. 
part of it was because of, of espionage. Uh, people like Kim Philby and others were letting them know that we were listening in to all their conversations. Uh, part of it was it was just time for them to kind of move on to a new system. So if you picked up a book about SIGINT during the Cold War, you'd actually read, it probably would be a chapter about Black Friday, which is August 25th, 1948, where the Soviets changed every cryptologic system that they had. The book would probably say, after this, we were completely deaf to what the Soviets were doing. But that's not the whole story. That's not the whole story because the Soviets were still communicating some of their messaging using that nine channel system that was being intercepted by the allies by using the Russian fish to, to gather information. Now, it wasn't everything. It wasn't all the important information. Yeah. But the idea that we were deaf after the Black Friday, which is essentially what history has said now for 70 years, was nonsense because we were still intercepting communications from the Soviets because they assumed that this was an unbreakable system. They didn't know we had this. They didn't know the Nazis had this to begin with, mm -hmm. and we we're using it. Now, this got put into our storage when it was still classified, and it sat there for decades and decades and decades. I'm picturing Raiders of the Lost oh, Ark with no crates question. that are back there that have a stamp on them that over the mists of time, people forget what's in there until you get the opportunity to dig in. Well, that, and that's the cool thing about it was exactly. We, warehouse is just floor to ceiling crates that are falling apart and deteriorating. And in some cases you're pulling them apart. What's in here? Having no idea what you're gonna run into. And we got the opportunity to do that because of COVID, because we had no visitors coming in. We went and did a really in-depth line by line, object by object inventory of what we had. And we ran into stuff and said, okay, we have no idea what this is. But a lot of stuff was put into holdings back in 1950, whatever, okay. as you know, German encryption machine, World War II. Right. No other information. Right. And you're like, well, that doesn't help me much. Right. And so we did a, a deep dive. We have archives here at NSA. We also have the Center for Cryptologic History. And so, so we did a lot of research on some of these artifacts. And this one, we actually paid, paid her. Mm -hmm. And we found there was an article about this being used during the Second World War, um, but no one knew where the actual Russian fish was because it was sitting in our warehouse for the last 70 years. But you had a good enough description of it that you could match up this this object, which otherwise I, I see a few words on it near the dials, but they're basically channel numbers, right? Yeah, there's nothing on this that actually tells us what it is. But you had a good enough description yeah. that you could match it up right. and then have people say, oh yeah, th this is the beast. Yes, yeah. exactly. And we were able to do that for multiple artifacts that we couldn't identify because when they were put into our warehouse, uh, no one gave us any information on them. Uh, so we had to do some real deep dives when it came to research to try to figure out what we were dealing with. So now we're, we're walking between exhibit spaces here and I'm noticing some, some books. Now, most people would not assume that the museum next to the National Security Agency would have some really old books, but I'm looking <laughs> at one here that is older than any I have in my collection, certainly, and it certainly looks like something that is exceedingly rare. Talk a little bit about what we're looking at here. So we have on display uh, the oldest book written on cryptology uh, by a man named Trithemius. He was a monk and it dates from 1518. Um, we, uh, you know, we, we try to have uh, something for everyone. And mm -hmm. I think that's really what this space is, our rare book space, uh, where if you're kind of a hardcore crypto person or a bibliophile or a nerd, you really kind of focus in on this area because it is, uh, I love it because yeah. I, I'm a book guy myself. So we have a rare book collection as part of the museum. Uh, don't worry, we're gonna be rotating these books so that they're not constantly on display, uh, not constantly being degraded by light and everything else. Right now we have four on display, it'll be a constant rotation. Uh, Trithemius will always be on display, not this book, we actually have a couple of them. <laughs> so we'll be rotating the ones that are on display, but you'll always get an opportunity to see the oldest known book on cryptography in the world. Uh, right across from it's a much more recent book, but it's also something that anyone who does intelligence history will recognize. Uh, Herbert Yardley wrote a book called The American Black Chamber. Uh, really, he's kind of the first leaker um, that we kind of look at in American history, kind of leaked the information about uh, this signals intelligence operation out of the State Department in the, in the 19 teens and 20s. Uh, the book became a big, you know, 
controversy because it told information about secret plans. Uh, you can still buy it today. Mm -hmm. um, we have the original manuscript. So the one that Yardley typed out on his typewriter and yep. sent into his editor with all the notes and everything in that in the margins. Uh, this is the original manuscript for the American Black Chamber. There's a cool letter here too where his publisher, and anyone who's written a book will understand this, his publisher was kind of skeptical about what he was telling them. He's like, we've never heard of this. The government's denying this. Why are the only are you the only one that has this story? And he goes, basically the letter saying, I assure you, this is true. The government can whine all they want, but they certainly can't say it's not real. Uh, and when we publish this, it'll, it'll be fine. These are great, Vince, because a lot of this museum is uh, at least on the surface, about technology, right. right? It's about this computer and the evolution of it. But here, I mean, this goes to show that, you know, substitution ciphers and codes, they go back hundreds, probably thousands of years. And you have some of the true artifacts here that are literal code books of, of how is it that people can decode messages that are sent just written in letters back when that was the way because we didn't have electronic communications. So the whole history of cryptology does appear to be here. Well, I mean, much in the same way as when you look at the history of human intelligence, right? It's, it's the, the basic philosophy stays the same. It's just sometimes technology helps us do things in a different way. Mm -hmm. And I think that's true across the board with intelligence, collection, analysis, everything. The fundamentals don't change. Right. The ways we do it maybe change, but what we're doing stays the same. And so that's, it's true for cryptography also. It's, it's still, you're trying to hide a message. You're trying to send a message to your ally or your friend and make sure that your adversary can't read it. Yeah. And then vice versa, right? You're trying to intercept the communication from someone you don't like to someone else. Yep. And you're trying to read that, that secret message. How we do it now has changed pretty dramatically, uh, but it's the same concept overall. While we walk to the next thing you wanna show us, uh, talk a little bit about the difference between cryptography, cryptology, cryptological, cryptologic. <laughs> what, what are the different terms? Do they matter for the average person looking at this? I mean, they really don't unless you kind of want to get into a kind of wording. I mean, all, anything with ology at the end of it is the study of. Mm -hmm. All right. So when we're talking about cryptology, we're talking about the study of, of in this case, hidden messages, hidden words, mm -hmm. all those things. The word we kind of use more than anything else is cryptanalysis. Mm -hmm. So this, or these are the people who are actually breaking the codes or cryptanalysts. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are using the math or using the technology to break the codes. Um, but for the most part, the words tend to be interchangeable for the right. general public. It's only when you really want to get nerdy about it and, and get very specific that one matters versus the other. There's also the making of the codes. And it seems here there is much more of a focus on the, the breaking than the making, even though both happen next door. Well, crypt cryptography, uh -huh. right? When you kind of look at that suffix, the graph suffix, it's writing, right? Writing codes. So it, it's just kind of, you know, a little bit more, uh, you know, kind of getting really kind of semantic on mm -hmm. things that you, I don't think you need to get all that semantic on. The idea is code making, code breaking, keep it really simple. Um, and then, you know, people want to get somewhat uh, picky about codes versus ciphers, which I completely understand. Uh, we use them not interchangeably because they should not be used interchangeably, but we have both here yeah. in the museum. Um, and, and a code is just something where you transpose a word or a, or a, a, a thing or a, an action into something directly mm. else, right? So you may have a code book that tells you whenever I want to say David Priest and said I'm going to say uh, the number nine, mm. you know, or Vince Houghton is going to be the number 10 or whatever. That's a code. That's a direct transition of one thing into another. A cipher is actually a way of hiding language. It's using, you can use a cipher for anything right. uh, in order to make it indecipherable, right? You know, that word right in the middle of that, you can understand that concept. So ciphers tend to be more um, versatile than codes in many respects. You don't need to carry a big book around with you. You don't need to have something that's directly telling you what the code is. But once you break a cipher, you've broken the cipher, which means any message sent using that specific cipher has now been broken. Yep. Whereas you can get a coded message, and if you don't actually have the code book, you're, you're, done. you're basically screwed, yeah. uh, unless they're really lazy and really bad at their jobs. But if you do it well, yeah. codes are really hard to break unless you have some hint at what's being used. We've, we've made our way over to something that's the largest thing I've yet seen in the museum that doesn't have the word cray on it. It's, it's taller than I am. It's probably six and a half to seven feet tall and maybe 10 feet wide. And what it reminds me of is the machine in the movie The Imitation Game that uh, Alan Turing uh, supposedly was the only one who could create. 
um, because it has a bunch of turns and dials and switches and rotors. Rotors. Don't forget the rotors. I mean, the key to this, right? lots of rotors here. So. Is this somehow related to that? Because that's the only analog I have for it. Yeah, so this is, uh, not only it is the largest, it's the heaviest. Moving this was a lot of fun. <laughs> uh, this is the US Navy cryptal analytic bomb, the four rotor version. So what you saw in the imitation game and what the British were so effective at breaking once the Polish had kind of told them and sent them in the right direction mm -hmm. was the three rotor. Enigma. And the three rotor Enigma is a standard Enigma. It was what was being used across Germany at the beginning of the Second World War. But eventually, the German submarine force added a rotor to their Enigmas and made it a four rotor Enigma, which stymied Bletchley Park and mm -hmm. Alan Turing and team because their machines were not designed to break a four rotor Enigma. Okay. So, for the several months, about 10 months of what they called the Shark Blackout, they had nicknamed the four rotor Enigma the Shark. So, during mm -hmm. the the months that they could not break the shark, millions and millions of tons of shipping was sent to the bottom of the Atlantic because they, the submarines were able to move around with impunity. Eventually, they decide they need America's help, not because we're better mathematicians, just because we have the, the industrial capability of building these machines. So they came to the United States and they worked with a man named Joe Desch, an engineer at the National Cash Register Company. Um, and built over a hundred of these machines cool. and networked them together and started churning out solutions to the four rotor enigma. And once we were able to do that, the war turned pretty dramatically. Uh, we knew where all their submarines were. Uh, we were able to reroute convoys around the submarines and then eventually to destroy the submarines. I think, so you can look this up because I'm pulling this out of my head, but something like three out of every four German submariner died during the war. The, oh. the, 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 the casualty rate for German submarine force was like 75%, which is absolutely ridiculous. Mm -hmm. So 100 plus of these were made. The other ones were melted down to use the steel. This is the only remaining four rotor analytic bomb in the world. Wow. Uh, and like I talked about, when we want to have the only thing or the first thing. You've got it. This is it. This is the only one left. Uh, it used to be the old museum. This was on display. It was behind a big glass case. Uh, we took the case away. We want people to actually get up and look at it. Don't touch it because it's, you know, it's an artifact, but get their nose close and actually understand what's going on here, seeing vacuum tubes and cables and everything else. The kind of engineering that was pretty extraordinary in the 1940s. Uh, and this machine was integral uh, in breaking that four rotor enigma, which I, I, I'm a, I hate counterfactualism um, and how much impact did this have mm -hmm. on the war. It had significant impact. Winston Churchill says it took two years off the end of the war. I disagree with that, but whatever, who am I to argue with Winston but Churchill? But it helped. It helped a lot, <laughs> yeah. right? It helped significantly because once we knew what their submarines were doing and where they were, uh, it, it, they basically were completely neutralized and their impact yeah. on the war was gone. Yeah. Okay, what else is in this room that we really need to focus on? I, I, I see something that I've seen before <laughs> in this container and I have a feeling that most people know the story, but what's the one paragraph about Enigma itself? So Enigma was a, a machine created actually by uh, a German inventor, not a military man, uh, invented for commercial use for banks and merchants and others to send confidential account information or monetary information. The German military realized how effective it could be mm -hmm. uh, and, and tweaked it a little bit to make it much more secure and then used it just about for every communication. Mm -hmm. uh, we have one Enigma on display here that was is a commercial Enigma. Uh, one of two bought by William Friedman, who is uh, kind of our grandfather here, the, the most yeah. important, one of the most important male cryptologists in American history. Friedman, when Enigma came out, purchased two for studying them. Uh, and this is the, the one that is still in existence here Good at choice. NSA. Uh, this is a story about purple, actually, which is the other side of the Second World War story. So this okay, is so we've moved right next to the Enigma machine is, is a larger machine here that is... I would say probably three, four times the size of it, but obviously related uh, in terms of the substance. So what's the difference between Purple and Enigma? There are a couple of differences. Uh, one of the main ones is that Enigma used rotors mm -hmm. to actually step through the different encryption system. Purple used telephone stepping switches. And the best way to describe that is if you think of those old timey telephone operators where they're moving the switches around, that's kind of how in, uh, Purple operated. Purple was the diplomatic code for the Japanese, so as they sent messages from their embassies around the world, uh, Enigma was used for diplomacy, but also for military operations. It was much more mobile 
and, and then, then purple was. Now, this is not a purple machine. This is actually what we call purple analog number one. Mm. This was built by William Freeman and his team at the Signals Intelligence Service to break purple. Mm. So this particular machine, and I said purple analog number mm -hmm. one, the first machine that could read purple messages, this actual machine translated the 14 point message sent by the Japanese to their embassy before Pearl Harbor mm. that we were able to intercept and read. Actually, we knew what it said before they presented it to the White House. Uh, and we said it was breaking off communication. So the war was about to begin. Mm -hmm. We were able to decipher this before they actually gave it to the White House. Uh, this was the machine that did it. And that's why this is on display. And for students of diplomatic and military history, if you've seen the word magic in World War II yeah. communications, is, is this where intelligence that was given the code word magic? Right, came from? so this is magic intelligence, actually the, the folder inside the case with Enigma in the briefcase, mm -hmm. that was what the magic intelligence was carried around in to the people that were cleared for it, which was not very many uh, in that briefcase. And this is kind of similar to what you've written about, David, kind of the presidential daily briefing where um, in, instead of being sent to a lot of different people like the PDB is, uh, there's a very short list of people who were cleared for magic intelligence. Yeah. Actually, Harry Truman wasn't cleared until he was president, when he was vice president for magic intelligence. And so this information was brought to someone like George Marshall, let's mm -hmm. say, and the individual that brought it would stand there while Marshall read it. And then when he was done, he had to hand it back to the courier and he walked out the door It never left his sight. That's how that. controlled this information was. Let's get back to Enigma, because we actually have some really interesting things here that I think people get a kick out of. The two Enigma machines here on the outside, and that's mm -hmm. what these are. You're gonna see me do something here that you don't tend to see people do in a museum all that often. You're literally turning on Enigma and playing with it. I sure am. We actually have two machines that we allow our visitors to actually operate. Real captured German Enigma machines. These are not reproductions. These are not created for fun public stuff. These are real captured German Enigma machines mm -hmm. that talk to each other because the rotors are the same and the plug board is the same. Ah. So you can sit here, you can write your own message out mm -hmm. and then you can send it to your buddy who's sitting in the other one and they can decipher it using the other Enigma machine, real ones that work uh, that we let our visitors touch. Now this is remarkable and I, I do wanna talk about this a little bit because uh, modern museums make a point of making it a, a tactile experience. Sometimes that's touch screens, sometimes that's manipulating things on recreations. You're actually letting people send codes with actual Enigma machines, one to another. Yeah, I mean, we have all the touch screen stuff and the other tactile things, but we wanna make, uh, we have that asset, right? You kinda think of like, what are, the assets that make you you as a museum like what and we have a lot of enigmas <laughs> and i know it's kind of one of these like humble brags it's yeah. like we have so many enigmas but we're the nsa right so at the end of the war we captured a ton of enigmas we have about 50 of them mm -hmm. uh and so we've decided to allow two of them to be used by the public right. uh because what better way to learn about this the machine than actually touch it and see how it works and move the rotors and, and touch the keys and encrypt in information yeah. using enigma Right. And I, I can't think of a better way of doing that. So I have to ask, do you have someone in, in the NSA family, let's say, who is an engineer that if something breaks on one of these machines is actually the person you call, you know, 911 Bob and Bob comes over and actually fixes this the way that we might have somebody correct any other electronic malfunction in another piece of equipment in our home. We used to have an Enigma fixer. Uh, he's long since retired, so we've learned everything we possibly could from him. Uh, the good news is that NSA is full of engineers, and actually our collections manager has learned a lot about how to fix these Enigmas. Uh, so, so far, so good. Yeah. Right, we're not in a We'll position. keep our fingers crossed. We haven't had to retire any of them because they've been too broken, but um, I'm looking at something else here, Vince, yeah. that I, I have to interrupt you for because it's one of the rare things here that is behind a fully protected glass case. And it says, Hitler's Enigma. This can't be what I think it is. It's actually exactly what you think it is. So the, the Germans made uh, what's called the B variant of the, the Enigma machine. And there were 24 of them made that were solely for the use of Hitler and messages to his high command and from his high command. So in many, whenever Hitler was in headquarters, he wasn't communicating using Enigma. He'd actually be using the Lorenz cipher, which uh -huh. is what gives us the computer revolution, right? That's what Colossus was made to beat. But when Hitler was in a car or a train or a plane or any time he was moving anywhere where the Lorenz, which is the size of a room, couldn't fit, he brought along 
he, his people, mm -hmm. brought along one of these B variant enigmas. Um, and the only real difference looking at it, mm -hmm. I mean, there's a lot of difference in how it works, is the red lettering. So you can see red letters on the plug board right. and red numbers on the rotors. That's the immediate way that you can spot a B variant enigma. And was that discovered because people uh, after the war found these that could only have been used by Hitler and those immediately around him? Or were, were there messages that said, hey, the ones with the red letters are the B series? It's a combination of a lot of things. Combination of research and actually capturing these in places like the Eagle's Nest where Hitler was at the end of the war. Uh, so like I said, they made 24 of those B variants. Guess what? This is the only one left. Oof. So the only one on Earth that was used uh, by Hitler exclusively in his high command um, is ours uh, here on display. And that's, yes, that's why it's in this special case. Uh, that's why we're making sure to use specific lighting for it. We don't want yeah. this to deteriorate. Uh, this is a microclimate case, so we mm -hmm. want to make sure that it's uh, going to be maintained for generations to come. It also helps to have two working Enigma machines across the room from each other to send messages to so people aren't tempted to touch this one. Yeah, well, that's the glass is pretty thick, so I think we're pretty <laughs> okay with that. Okay, I want to talk about provenance a little bit, uh, uh, an issue that is either the joy of a curator or the nightmare and headache of a curator, which is trying to confirm that something is what, what someone claims it is. And I bring that up because I'm looking at something that is known to many, the Jefferson Cipher, uh, the cylindrical device that was used presumably by Thomas Jefferson in order to basically create and send and, and decrypt codes. Now, tell me about this artifact and what it tells us about provenance. So we actually have a special label right here talking about provenance, because this is a great example of how difficult it is uh, to work in museums when you're dealing with artifacts in the, that are hundreds of years old in this case. So we know certain things about this. We know this is the oldest known cipher device in the world. Mm -hmm. Like we absolutely know that to be true because of carbon dating and a lot of other things. Mm -hmm. We also know it was found very near Monticello. It dates from a time period where Jefferson lived. Mm -hmm. It is very, very similar to stuff that he wrote about and drew in his writings. Right. And it was written in French. In French, uh, not only was Jefferson a Francophile, but French was the language of diplomacy. Jefferson was first Secretary of State. He was the ambassador to France. All these things make us call it the Jefferson Cipher, but we put quotes around <laughs> Jefferson Cipher because we don't know if he actually made it, if he actually used mm -hmm. it. We just have circumstantial evidence that leads us to think that this could have been a cipher used by Thomas Jefferson. Mm -hmm. So there are things we know, things we don't know, and we're being very honest. And we want our visitors to understand that there's certain things we just can't prove. I uh, absolutely love, Vince, that on the display you, you describe for the people who don't have the pleasure of you walking around with them here, who, who, who lay out what we know in, in the order that you have laid it out. But under what we don't know, you helpfully say, we don't know who made it, who used it, and how it was used, or who owned it, and everything else. Like there's a whole lot around, there's so many stories involving this that have just been lost. And you're being very open and honest about that in order to inform people about what they can and can't take away from each artifact. Yeah, we can't not put the oldest known cipher device in the world on display that could have been used by Thomas Jefferson. So I've got to put this on display, but I got to be really honest about what we know and what yep. we don't know about it. And I yep. think that we've had a really good balance here of, hey, look, this could be really, really cool. I mean, it's cool anyway, right? Because of how old it is. Yeah. But this could be amazingly cool, but we're not sure, and we're never gonna be sure. So we're gonna do the best that we can. Part, part of provenance, of course, is chain of custody. So what, what do you know and what don't you know about how this was handed down from the late 18, the late 18th century um, to today? We have no idea. I mean, this was, it was discovered uh, not too long ago, right next by Monticello, and because okay. of how we're able to date it, we know kind of where it dates from, right? The early 19th century. So when Jefferson was living Got it. at Monticello, um, because of the ability to date it also, we know it is older than any other known cipher device in the world. Understood. But now we're in a position where who the hell knows what else, Yeah. All right? It looks very, very similar to stuff that Jefferson wrote about and drew in his writings. So either it was a copy, it was something he used, it was something somebody, maybe he saw it and wrote about it, who knows? We, we just can't get that answer for us. One other question, not related to an artifact here, but you brought up that this, you know that this is the oldest cipher wheel of its type. Is there a possibility that we, there will be some find in ancient Rome or China? Do we know enough about the culture of codes to know that it is 
virtually impossible that there could be a cipher wheel created in ancient Rome, or could we wake up one day and have the surprise of our lives and find that 2,000 years before we thought it was possible culturally that somebody else had developed such a device? I mean, I hope so. It'd be awesome, right? Yeah. I mean, I'm not- And then you'd I, want to get it. Right, and then I'd, yeah, I'd be like, hey, so how are you going to give that to me? Look, we, we can never say never in most respects. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that especially in uh, history of intelligence, mm -hmm. you know, there's so much is destroyed after the fact. Certainly people aren't writing a lot about this. You know, they, right. they don't put this in memoirs. Um, that's the trick, right? That's the trick with every intelligence museum has to deal with uh, is, most of this stuff was designed to be hidden and not talked about. So maybe we mm. find out about this stuff, maybe yeah. we don't. We can only say, that's why we use the word like, oldest is thought to be the oldest truth, you know, right. known site. Those are the kind of things where we have to kind of hedge because yeah. we don't want to kind of overstep our bounds because it's embarrassing if somebody says, you're wrong. Sure. I mean, I don't think we are. I think that we we're, we're very capable of kind of tracking history and understanding yeah. how the process played out, uh, how different methods were used mm -hmm. throughout history. But who knows, right? It could have been lost because people, it died off with some civilization and people didn't talk about it. Right. Or it was so secret. It was kept secret enough yeah. and no records were kept. Exactly. Uh, one thing before we move on from this area is there, there is an invisible ink, not just display, but also what looks like a little workshop for people to write messages, decode them using invisible ink. Um, I wanna highlight this because, and please correct me because I'm sure I'm wrong on one of the details here. But I remember hearing the story that one of the oldest still classified secrets in the United States until our working lifetime was some invisible ink recipe from the First World War. Um, that means that, think about all the potential secrets in the US government, that the thing that was most tightly held for a while was something having to do with some form of invisible writing. Um, and, and here you have people just doing it. So talk just a little bit about the value of secret writing and what's good and bad about it, especially in a museum context. Well, I mean, if you can write and the writing disappears, then you're in really good shape, yeah. right? I mean, that, that's something that everyone would love to be able to do. And it, and it still happens today, not very often, because there's much easier ways of doing things. But we know certainly in the Second World War that a lot of people wrote in what we would call invisible ink. Uh, the story of Josephine Baker is a great one here mm -hmm. where on her sheet music, as she moved around occupied France, in between the lines, she wrote messages from the resistance to the resistance in invisible ink. This is actually what we have here is a hands-on interactive focusing on the revolutionary period mm. and what Washington called sympathetic stain. Essentially, yep. it was a invisible ink recipe designed by a man named James Jay, uh, who is a physician and the brother to John Jay, mm -hmm. who later on becomes the first chief justice of the Supreme Court, et cetera. Um, and we know through writings and everything else what actual recipe they used. Uh, and so here's an opportunity here for our visitors to kind of test that out and write. Right. Um, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. If you've seen certain movies, they have uh, don't light the Declaration of Independence on fire for Christ's sake. I knew we would uh, get to national treasure yeah. somehow. But this is not that. We're not asking people to light a flame or anything else like that. Certainly not the way sympathetic stain worked. It was just a chemical reaction mm -hmm. uh, that brought not only created the um, the the writing on the page, but also brought it out. Yeah. Uh, and so we're not messing with the World War One super top secret invisible ink recipe. We're going back to <laughs> the revolutionary period to look at what they used during that time. Perfect. Let's uh, let's look at just a couple of other things before we sit down and chat a little bit more about that cultural representation of cryptology and how especially movies have flavored the way that the American people and others think about codes, code breaking, surveillance, things of those issues. Um, but I say in a couple of minutes, because there's a couple of other things we, we really have to talk about here. Now we're moving into gallery three, which is my favorite gallery. Not that the other two aren't amazing, but this is one that's kind of very near and dear to my heart. Uh, here we're focused on the defensive side, and we really have four major areas within this gallery. One is focused on written communication. So how do we encrypt our own messages right. when we're writing them? One focus on voice communication. So radios, how do we create encryption for radios or telephones, everything else? One focus on space communication. So how do we maintain encrypted communications between the ground and space Got for it. 
missions that may be more def defense department focused or even for everyday operations, you know, so that hackers and others can't come into it. We look at cyber, uh, which is very hard to do in a museum, but we had a great yeah. gift from DARPA that allowed us to do a wonderful hands-on exhibit about cyber. Mm -hmm. And then I'm saving my best for last is the whole back wall of this space right. is focused on nuclear command and control. Yeah. Let's, and, let's focus on that because you've yeah. got some interesting things on display and you know the stories behind them literally as well as almost anyone in the world from your research. So talk a little bit about nuclear codes and why there's such a feature on it here. Well, what's great about this um, from a historian perspective is that these have never been on display before. And I don't mean just that we didn't have them out in any museum, that they literally never been outside of NSA before. Mm. These were classified when the, when the museum closed back for the beginning of COVID. So they are recently declassified, and I mean really, really recently declassified. And to our to the left on your radio dial is what we call the deck alpha. And the deck alpha are these servers, and they created two things that were very important. One was the nuclear codes. And mm -hmm. I don't mean some nuclear codes or whatever, the, the capital <laughs> T nuclear codes that the president would use to start a nuclear war. And what time frame are we talking about? From the 1980s mm -hmm. all the way until just a couple years ago. Amazing. So the late 20 teens. Yeah, yeah. And they created what were called the permissive action links or the PALs, mm -hmm. which were the codes on the weapons themselves. Mm -hmm. So to make sure that weapons are not stolen by terrorists or by crazies or anybody else, mm -hmm. uh, or a government gets overthrown and all of a sudden our weapons are there, the permissive action link locks the weapon and prevents it from actually being used and fired. So the deck alpha creates the top and the bottom, basically, of the mm -hmm. nuclear chain, the presidential authorization codes and the ones that are on the weapons themselves. Right. On the other side of the space is what we call the MP37. The MP37 creates what's called the biscuit. So these are the cards. If you've seen Crimson Tide or you've seen mm -hmm. War Games or anything else like that, inside nuclear silos, submarines, bombers, uh, when they get a message from the president saying start World War III, yep. they go to their safe, they open the safe, two-man rule, two different parts yep. of the safe, they pull out a card, they break the card, and inside of it is a coded message that they have to link up with the code on whatever was sent from the president to make right. sure it was from the actual president. It's, it's authentication, right. basically. It's actually, these yeah. are, instead of the biscuit, it's also called the sealed authenticator system, yep. right? So these, the MP37 made those for the entire American nuclear program. So from the very beginning to the very end, the president orders the launch, mm -hmm. that goes down to the actual physical entities that would be starting World War III, submarines, uh, ICBM silos, bombers, they would check the message and make sure the message is authentic. Mm -hmm. And then in some cases, the permission of action links, what the uh, deck alpha creates, those codes we put into that you can arm the weapons and actually use them in combat. So that is all here for the very first time ever put on display uh, because these were absolutely classified until recently. So Vince, I got to interrupt to ask you this because people can say, but come on, Vince, we all know that nuclear weapons, it's the Department of Energy. It's not, an NSA doesn't control the nuclear weapons, but this is a different part of it. It's not the nuclear weapon, right? No, I mean, this is, this is the process of authorization, right? Of actually to communicate that World War III is going to begin, to communicate yeah. launching these weapons, uh, you don't want that to be unencrypted, right? You don't want people to be able to do that and fake that they're the president. You don't yeah. want to be able to intercept that communication, right, if you're actually doing it in secret. So you wanna make sure that these are things that cannot be spoofed. Yeah. So you have a machine, again, making the nuclear codes that does it at a very, very, High to, level? Very high yeah. levels are a way of putting this, right? Yeah. And then you have the sealed authentication system that makes sure that it is the president who's actually doing this. And then even off to the side here, we have some of the kind of very straightforward encryption systems to make sure that the actual words being sent to these different silos or different things are not being listened into. Okay. So in this case, the KI-21 was in what was called the Airborne Launch Control Center. Mm -hmm. So this is the aircraft flying in the air that will take control of any nuclear war if Washington gets taken out or all these other places are sacked in Omaha. This was the ComSec system to make sure that you couldn't listen in to conversations taking place between the Airborne Launch Command Center and anywhere else. And the KI-22 was the same basic idea inside a Minuteman III silo. Mm. So messages being sent down to an American nuclear missile silo, you don't want those intercepted by bad guys or anyone else. Right. So you have the communication security system that that is designed to prevent that from happening. And yep. 
as you might expect, we don't use these anymore. Right. Right. Even though, yes, the Minutemen 3 are still on, on, on active duty. But we've uh, upgraded. We've upgraded the systems, right? Yep. And that's why we can put this stuff on, on display is because w everything we have is obsolete. We talked earlier about this idea that technology moves quickly. Yeah. And when technology becomes obsolete, then we can put it on display. One fascinating side note before we end on the artifacts here for people who have gotten an education in recent months about the difference between levels of classification, confidential, secret, top secret, due to issues at Mar-a-Lago. It's fascinating to look at these devices, which had to do with actual nuclear code security, and see that they are classified at secret, not top secret. What's the story there? So the story of what we can say about it yeah. is there's very little you can gain from actually looking at the thing from the outside. Okay. Um, secret is basically saying that if it falls into the hands of an adversary, there'd be grave danger. Um, top secret is like especially grave danger, right? That's like, so just looking at it from the outside and actually seeing that yeah. really doesn't give you a ton of information it. about it. So that's kind of the difference. That's why- Both sides like, of the code are top secret. The, this actual yeah, device is yes. secret. So what's being sent along these things yeah. is beyond that, right? So, yeah. but the actual physical honking piece of metal, uh, it's just secret classification. Right. Uh, and then finally, we look at space communication. And, and we have two sides of the coin here as well, kind of mm -hmm. where we talked about uh, NC2, which is nuclear command and control, having the top and the bottom. We have that here as well. So this mm -hmm. is the mission control console for the space shuttle, all right, from Houston. Now the space shuttle has been retired. So this is a big, you know, I, and I have to say, if you've seen Apollo 13 yeah. or, well, you name the space movie, this is going to look familiar to you because Hollywood tries to recreate these, in some cases fairly accurately, in other cases really poorly. But this is one that looks like it's from the 1970s, but it was actually used in the 1980s and 90s, right? Well, all the way up to 2011, right, wow. to the last space shuttle mission. So it's, yeah, it's about the size of a stand-up piano. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was the mission control console that controlled the encryption uh, to and from the space shuttle. Okay. Uh, then on the other end, is uh -huh. this piece, which was the KG-46. This was the encryption piece on the space shuttle itself. The one that we have on display was the one pulled out of the wreckage of the space shuttle Challenger. Oh. And it's still in relatively decent shape. It's, it's damaged, but it held yeah. up pretty well considering. Yeah, so you've got, again, both ends of that conversation too, where- Amazing. They... Vince, let's sit down and talk a little bit more about the connection of all this to uh, our collective history. Yeah. Okay, so we've, we've moved out of the exhibit space and we're just gonna chat here for a moment, but I have to say, even in your office here, Vince, I'm noticing that a couple of chairs here are not like the others. The others, you know, nice government issue, but on the nice end, so you've done well. But there's, there's two that look old and leathery. Uh, what chair am I sitting in right now? So when we went through RFX inside the warehouse, we found some things that would, should not be considered historical RFX, desk chairs and desks themselves and other things that just somebody decided to send to the museum because they had nothing better to do. Okay. Uh, two of them are the chairs that I stole from my office. Um, they were used for the, uh, the christening of a new NSA building back in the 1980s. NSA had a, a building that they were opening up uh, that is still here on campus. Uh, and it just so happened that the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan, and the Vice President of the United States, George H.W. Bush, came to this ceremony. Uh, and they were given these very cushy chairs to sit in because they're the President mm. and the Vice President. And afterwards, they sent the chairs directly to the museum holdings because they were museum pieces because the President and Vice President's butt sat in them for like 30 minutes. That is not what a museum artifact is. Uh, and so while they're still part of our collection, they're still technically artifacts, uh, I keep them in my office instead of having them in our collections. So, so I am sitting where the former director of Central Intelligence right. and vice president of the United States, George H.W. Bush, sat when he came for that dedication. Right, yeah, so you're in the Bush chair. And I'm looking at the Reagan chair. He's, he's not there, but. I've sat in both. The Reagan's a little more comfortable, but I Oops. get the whole CIA Bush connection thing for you. It makes <laughs> I had more to sense. do it. So you've got an interesting job here connecting the public to cryptology and the history of everything from codes to to surveillance to the space technology there's a lot that pop culture gets right and wrong about these things um probably the first time i actively thought about it was the da vinci code because i mean pretty simple codes you could say this is the most important secret known to mankind and yet the codes are childish in some ways um, but talk about what the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown did for actually opening up cryptology to the mass public, and then what you think did well or poorly following up on that. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that people for the very first time, like you said, thought about this kind of thing. The fact that there are hidden messages around that have, you know, people have been doing this for centuries at this point. Yeah. You're right that if you've got something that significant, potentially, you'd probably do a better job uh, in protecting it. Uh, there are certainly very simple, straightforward codes that could have been used that would never have been broken, mm. but maybe you want it to be broken, right? That's the kind of mm -hmm. idea of, you know, what this would to be discovered someday. Um, I, I think that Da Vinci was was sending more of a cipher than a code. If you really yeah. want to get semantic about it, mm -hmm. I guess the Da Vinci cipher didn't quite have the same ring <laughs> the Da Vinci code did. Um, but again, that's kind of what I'm looking to do with this museum is to inspire people to kind of learn other things outside of it. And, and if Dan Brown did that, kudos to Dan Brown. Yeah. I mean, I think that the problem you run into is uh, with any book like that or any pop culture, and we can talk about this for a lot of pop culture, mm -hmm. is it looks real. And so people think it is without kind of yeah. questioning it. Uh, that was true for Imitation Game. That was true for uh, a lot of other things, certainly a lot of the CIA stuff that we could talk about, but we won't. Um, you know, Sneakers is a great example of where they went the opposite, just had a kind of a goofy romp. Right. But when the, when the movie or the series or, or any of those things comes across as being real and they have mistakes. It's a lot worse than a movie that you just like spies like us is less problematic than Homeland because people watch Homeland and think that's how it is. Right. People watch spies like us and it's go, a drama, oh, it's not goofy, a comedy. right? Yeah. And, and so I think that, you know, Dan Brown in, in many respects did a service by getting people interested in it, but did a disservice because it's top to bottom. It's a bunch of malarkey. Yeah. Um, and, and, and so people, uh, oh, I read that in Dan Brown, like the novel. You read that in the novel um, where he at the very beginning says like, here's what's true and everything else is false. And I think that's problematic. And I think even doing things like in the imitation game um, right. it is really troublesome. Yes, a lot of people know who Alan Turing is and that's incredibly important. Because yeah. Alan Turing was a very important person and the people understand Enigma and a little bit better than they did. Uh, but some of the dramatization that was off kilter in that movie, I think was really problematic for not just off kilter, but even from my limited understanding, so wrong that if people don't explore it, it, it does change history. Like whether Karen Cross was working with him or not, and my understanding is he didn't come anywhere no. near Turing physically. Whether in fact he was communicating secretly um, to the head of British intelligence uh, around the chain of command, and then of course I think most alarming was the idea that once they had broken German codes and they could save convoys of soldiers that uh, you were going across the Atlantic, that it was literally up to the code breakers right. to make the choice about whether to uh, alert the, the targets of German attacks or whether they were to preserve the codes themselves. Um, that was a ridiculous fiction that didn't need to be there because the Turing story is so intrinsically interesting without it that it really bothers me that the filmmakers went that direction. Well, and Turing commits treason twice in the movie. Within the first five minutes of the movie, he commits treason, right? Because Enigma and, and our ability to break Enigma was not declassified until the 70s. Yeah. And Turing was long dead by that point. So clearly, he does not have the authorization to tell a cop yeah. who is investigating him about Enigma. That story, that would have been punishable by either life in prison or something worse than that. And then he commits treason when he lets Karen Cross get away with... Yeah which doesn't happen. So so you basically have manufactured two instances where Turing, who is your hero, and we're supposed to feel sympathetic for because of his life, which we should, mm -hmm. commits treason twice in the kind of the really beginning yeah. of the movie. And to me, that's really problematic. They also cut out some very important people. And I think that, mm -hmm. yes, you could still focus on Turing, but without ignoring Gordon Welchman. Mm -hmm. Who doesn't even appear no. in the movie, even in a fictional representation. He, even not there. I mean, they, they did an amalgamation of a lot of other people with the Matthew Good character. Um, but they, they give him a real person's name, but they kind of amalgamate, you know, mm -hmm. the idea of the diagonal boards, which he comes up with, was actually Gordon Welchman who does that, right? So you should not eliminate some very, very important people. Yeah. They barely mention the Poles in there. The, if without the Polish, there's no Bletchley Park. Without the Poles, there's, there's no real head start on this project. And they would have gone from scratch and yeah. done it themselves. Yeah. And, you know, it was nice to include Joan Clark. Um, her her contribution was significant. Um, but I think they dramatically oversimplified how they break it. The Heil Hitler thing was, I mean, that's true to a degree. Um, but there's so much more there they could have done more with. Like mm -hmm. there's some of the covert actions that lead to 
help solution sets for Enigma, the HMS Bulldog, um, which um, there's another movie that we could talk about was U571, which yeah. uh, Tony Blair, I believe, when he was prime minister, said it was a direct insult to the the British people because it makes it an American story. Yeah. Right. The Americans yeah. are able to steal the Enigma is actually a, a British ship, the HMS Bulldog and <laughs> British sailors die to do it. And that was a big deal. And, and you're right in the idea that um, these guys weren't making policy decisions. Mm -hmm. They weren't, they were passing along code coded solutions and then they were doing that every day. And the people who were, working for Churchill were making the policy decisions, not Alan Turing. Mm -hmm. And Turing really only works on Enigma for a very short time period, right? I mean, he basically, once they figure out how to do it, yep. he moves He's on out. to actually working on the Lorenz cipher, which is what mm -hmm. Colossus goes and breaks. And then later in his life, he basically becomes a biologist, you know, and, and that's where um, he spends the majority of his last years kind of working on more biological questions than any kind of computer science stuff. So to me, I think in, this is consistent in other conversations we've had about the entertainment of intelligence issues. Filmmakers seem to think that there is not an audience for a true story that gets into some of that detail. You and I think some of that detail is more interesting than the fictionalized elements. Are are we wrong? Are they wrong? Or is it a mix of the two? So I think my, I mean, I don't ever think I'm wrong. So that's, that's an easy question. But <laughs> I think this is such a complicated subject that trying to do it in two hours is very difficult. Yeah. Um, people ask all the time, certainly when I was at the Spy Museum, like, what is the most realistic portrayal of intelligence? And I said, it's a six hour Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy with Alec Guinness, right? But it's six hours. And even I fall asleep about hour two and a half, right? But that that is realistic. It's a slow play. Yeah. It's really working at nights and slow. And I can say this without mm -hmm. if i said a number two it, it's turning out it could be andor which mm. i have a lot of conversations about it at a point because it's taking its time yeah and i think that that is what is missing from these two hour versions of things yeah don't try to tackle a story that's really complicated and try to do it in a in a movie theater yeah uh, especially now that we have the op opportunity to do like multi-season series about things yeah breaking enigma even alan turing needs to be 10 hours, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so yeah. much, it's so complicated. And they tried to, they reduced his personal life to something very kind of weird. Yep. Um, you know, yes, part of the story is that he's gay, but the the idea of um, the childhood crush and all that, I mean, Dermot Turing, who is Alan Turing's nephew and, and who is a, a, a very prominent historian in this field, he's mm -hmm. Sir Dermot Turing. Um, looks at that and just goes, what are they doing? Mm -hmm. Right? Like what, what is happening here? Right. And, and you don't have to make him, he's sympathetic no matter what, right? Because of what was done to him, right? You don't have to kind of stretch it to the point that right. they do there. And I think they could have spent that time doing other things. They could have spent that time actually talking about how amazingly difficult it was to break this code. They don't yep. do that, right? They kind of, no. they sit around, they go to a bar. They posit it that it's difficult, but right. they, they don't show yeah, how they, difficult. They have this epiphany, Heil Hitler, which is, fine that's kind of sort of right the idea is you're going to have stuff repeated. in every single message yeah. repeated yeah. but the big breakthrough in many respects was the the germans were sending weather ships mm -hmm. up to the north atlantic uh who were s sending back weather reports so that the bombers during the blitz would actually when they're flying to england would mm -hmm. know what the weather is yeah. well someone had a brilliant idea and it may have been turing it may not have been that these ships are on station for months at a time, which means they have Enigma settings for months at a time. They number don't one, change. Yeah. so let's do a covert action. Let's go grab those. But yeah. number two, they realize that weather reports are weather reports. And if you've heard one, you've heard all of them. Because if I'm doing a weather report for today, there are only so many words that are going to appear. The weather for Monday, October 31st is, so you know there's plain text in the beginning of it right yeah. off the bat. And you can use that to kind of work your way through it. That to me, you could have done in five minutes. And that's a much mm -hmm. more interesting story than, th than that. And, and so I don't know who they talk to or who they ask. They certainly mm -hmm. don't ask me uh, about how they should do this, <laughs> uh, but it seems like there's better ways. Yeah. You brought up Andor, and instead of talking about the entire intelligence picture of the Star Wars universe, let's talk just about codes and ciphers, um, both what they do, what they don't do, um, and what they could do. Because on the one hand, you have a C-3PO who is, what, fluent in six million dialects. That kind of a linguist, really good in traditional cryptology. 
uh, presumably also a genius at code breaking, given whatever wiring allowed that to happen. He should be good at some aspects of that. Um, and yet you have some comically bad, um, basically non-use of encrypted communications when this universe should have crazy encrypted communications in all cases. So talk through a little bit about the Star Wars experience, which more than anything else informed our generation culturally. We grew up thinking this is what the future, maybe the deep past, is like. When it comes to codes and ciphers, what do you think about it? Well, so the perfect the perfect person mm -hmm. for a code breaking unit is a crypto linguist, which is a kind of a nice fancy compound word. Looking at somebody who's an expert at cryptanalysis, mm -hmm. but also an expert linguist, right? Because yeah. you only have one person that can do both. The R two D two C three PO combination is the crypto linguist of the Star Wars universe, right? Mm -hmm. You have the person who speaks every language, mm -hmm. and then the guy who the guy the machine that can break <laughs> every single code known to man. Yeah. That should be all you need, mm -hmm. right? You've got this perfect yep. situation where you should be able to break in every single code. Now, we find out that even 3PO doesn't have the capability mm -hmm. of doing all that. You know, watch Empire Strikes Back. The Imperial probe droid is sending a, a coded message that even he doesn't know. Mm -hmm. So at least we know that the Empire has evolved its code system to be more advanced right. than kind of the base, which it should, right? You would hope they were doing that because to run an empire that's you know galactic, you need to have the capability of communication without that being intercepted, mm -hmm. especially if you've got a rebellion going on. Um, that to me is the realistic part of this is that there are codes that cannot be deciphered. Now, yeah. brings up a wonderful traffic analysis question, right? The idea is they can't read this code and so they conclude that it must be an Imperial droid because they can't read the code, mm. right? So they don't know what the actual code says, but because it's unreadable, they're able to conclude that it's coming from something being sent back mm -hmm. to the empire. But for the most part, you don't see good comsec across the board mm -hmm. uh, in the entire universe. I mean, that, that they probably didn't care about it in the movies. And they probably right. weren't thinking about it that Not way. Not a major plot point. Right. Not a major plot point. Um, we, we think that they originally are able to have some very effective SIGINT because they intercept the communication sent to Leia yep. um, about the Death Star. But it turns out it was literally handed to Leia, <laughs> so it wasn't necessarily intercepted in that way. Right, right. Um, it was kind of an unencrypted... Yeah. Bit, you know, yeah. PDF that was sent up from the planet. But, you know, you don't see a lot of that level of, there's a lot of human elements in there. There's certainly a lot of sensors and things that we call mm -hmm. nascent today. But the idea of intercepting communications is something you would think that the Empire would be really, really good at. Yeah. Because if you look at, you know, what brings in a lot of information and intelligence by modern civilizations, so whether Boom. it's the Russians, the Chinese, it's us, mm -hmm. the British, whatever, mm -hmm. it's SIGINT. Yeah. Right, it's intercepting because if you communicate, you're vulnerable. Right, if you're there's more than two or three people, you you got a potential problem when it comes to you know human intelligence. But if you're communicating with anything electronic, people are listening to it, mm -hmm. and that's what everybody's doing in the Star Wars universe. So why aren't they intercepting communications between um, Mon Mothma and you know Admiral Akbar? Why aren't they mm -hmm. intercepting like why don't they know everything about Leia because she's communicating via yeah. you know some kind of system that's obviously not that encrypted? Mm -hmm. Why aren't they using electronic warfare to jam the X wing as they're actually flying in to, to, to attack? The, the, they're they're working with droids and with systems with sensors and everything else where is the elint and the electronic ew i guess capability? that's part of the fantasy part of it is you can you can take some parts and assume massive advances in technology right, right? you know land speeders levitating and light speed that's got no and then on some very fundamental things you're like they're they're not even in cold war technology well, right. I mean, that's this is the limits of imagination of George Lucas and whomever yeah. else. The idea of you know he's he's not privy to the kind of what's being used on the intelligence side up until mm -hmm. that point, and so you do get some of these really weird mm -hmm. disconnects between ridiculously far fetched future technology that we're yeah. never going to get near with, and just things that don't make any sense. You know where. Um, you should be able to jam the communication between the droid and the pilot of an X-Wing. Mm -hmm. And that kind of screws them, right? If right. Luke can't you're talk done. to R2, you're, you're done. done, right? And that's the most basic thing. Like, we were doing that back in the 40s and 50s, right? <laughs> so even just that something that basic yeah. could be something that you should be able to do. Or, you know, everything's computerized. You know, why not a cyber attack, mm. right? We're obviously, not thinking about that in 1977, but yeah. we would be thinking about it today, right. you know? Or you have the... Uh, communications that are obviously having 
between Yavin Five, between the Rebel base mm-hmm. and the pilots. Right. That's also something that should be intercepted and listened to because they're basically telling, telling their plan, the attack runs. The attack right. runs. Those are all things that should be easily intercepted, and there's no yeah. conversation about how are you keeping this stuff encrypted because I don't think they are. Right. Um, so why has the Empire completely neglected signals intelligence? Eh, no empire is perfect. Well, right. I mean, to their demise because that would have yeah. really solved the problem. Yeah. So let's. Let's talk again about codes and, and ciphers. We've we've talked about a few movies already. Are there any fictional representations that, that we haven't talked about that you found are particularly good that people watching this can take away from it? Yeah, there, there, there's something good there about how it's done or its impact. Well, I mean, Sneakers is a favorite for a lot of people who work at NSA. But it's really the only movie that makes NSA not look terrible. Well, they have the, the famous beginning where the person introduces himself as from NSA uh, Robert Redford's character, Martin Bishop, I think, says, oh, so you're the ones listening in on my phone line. And they go, no, that's the FBI. And he goes, oh, you're the one overthrowing governments. No, that's the CIA. We're the NSA. We're the good guys. And it turns out he wasn't, I don't want to give away, but that there's a lot more going it's on It's a good there. movie. It's worth seeing. Right. And it, and it is one, unlike the enemy of the states of the world and others, it doesn't make NSA look like a bunch of villains, which right. we're pretty happy about. Um, but the same respect, uh, it actually has a pretty interesting portrayal of the power and influence of, of cryptography, mm-hmm. of the idea of uh, breaking encryption at a pretty high level. I mean, this really kind of predates the the conversations that we're all having in the 20 aughts and the 20 teens about collecting everything and reading everything and being kind of universally able to pull in information from everywhere. So the, mm-hmm. the basic plot line is someone invents this black box mm-hmm. uh, that just can decrypt everything. Now, yeah, I promise you this is fiction. <laughs> um, but it's a great plot device. But it's a it great really plot is. device. Uh, we actually have a little black box on display that I didn't show you that actually does the opposite. It creates random bits of code uh, yeah. to create uh, essentially unbreakable codes. Nothing's unbreakable. One time pad is the only thing that's unbreakable, but it gets really close. Yeah. So it's a little black box that just creates random numbers. This little black box, if you hook it up to something, it breaks the encryption automatically, which right. every, as they mentioned in the movie, there's not a country on earth that wouldn't kill to have mm-hmm. that technology. That is fiction, but that is pretty true to life, right? That, that is the, that's the goal. Of, that's the goal. That is the the ultimate ideal is having a singular technology mm-hmm. that can get you into everything. The reason NSA is a humongous building and we have places all over the world is that there is no technology like that. Yeah. You need lots of different technologies to get you into all the different systems that you want to get into, right? So it's no secret that our adversaries are, you know, with the Russians, the Chinese, the Iranians, the North Koreans, like that. I'm not breaking any classified right. information saying those are people that we're paying attention to, right? Mm-hmm. They have 30, 40, 50 different systems that we have to independently try to listen into. The one right? thing right. I love in the movie that points this out is at one point, uh, Robert Redford's character, Martin Bishop, they're doing yet another heist break in thing. And he encounters an electronic keypad and he's communicating back to his team and they're saying, well, this, we don't have a solution. This is unbreakable. What, what do I do? And he's listening carefully to step after step. And he just kicks in the damn door. Wait, this right? is, uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Oh, got it. Uh, it's, the, just, it's the Indiana Jones pulling right, out the gun exactly. and shooting the scimitar wielding adversary moment. But it does point out there are, there are different types of codes, ciphers, um, passwords, everything in there. And you may need different methods to do it. Sometimes brute force is the method. Yeah. I mean, I think that that's the flexibility is what I think makes NSA what it is, mm-hmm. is the fact that you have a lot of different people, with a lot of different skill sets yeah. that can do lots of different jobs, right? Because you have low tech adversaries, mm-hmm. ISIS or, you know, some terrorist organizations that are still relatively low tech, right? Mm-hmm. They're not developing their own encryption systems. Even, you know, when 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 Al Qaeda created what they called Mujahideen secrets, it was still kind of relatively low tech. And then you have nation state adversaries that are way beyond the, that level. And you need to be flexible enough to go after both and to take, you know, to take care of both. And then, of course, in the cyber domain, mm-hmm. you have a whole other issue there. So I, I think that what sneakers gets right uh, is that it's really, really important stuff. I mean, mm-hmm. there's no mm-hmm. there's no exact number that's class that declassified, but you might actually be able to tell us this from the, the unclassified sense and not get me fired mm. about how much of the presidential daily brief yeah. comes from signals intelligence. Um, it's a lot, right? Um, it's really, really important. Yeah. Uh, and I think the movie really gets that point across uh, 
you know, the idea that this one little black box would be the thing that every nation on earth would kill to get because right. it breaks through all these encryptions. Again, no, there's nothing like that in the world. I think mm-hmm. that's what it gets wrong. Um, and, and so, yeah. uh, but it's a movie that's absolutely worth watching because I can't imagine there, there may not be a movie made that has more Oscar winners in it. I mean, it's, it's just the cast is stunning. It's the ultimate Kevin Bacon game, right? When you're right. trying to connect you've between movies. Redford, James years. Earl Jones, you've got Sidney Poitier, you've got um, Ben Kingsley, you've got River Phoenix, you've got, um, yeah. It, but you do yeah, have right. in sneakers the actor, and I, I forgot his name, I'm so sorry. I think he passed away recently. Um, he played Ned Ryerson in Groundhog Day, right? That guy too. Phil's old friend. Yep. So yeah, it's the ultimate connecting movie. Um, you mentioned earlier when we were walking around the artifacts that something that's really hard to do is to, in a museum space, but I would say in, in Hollywood as well, is to show cyber, right? In a yeah. way that's compelling. When it comes to cryptology, the, I think the, the next step of that is the, the quantum you know, quantum computing and quantum cryptology. Important concept. Pe- good, you know, good, smart men are working on it and even smarter women. Is there any way that that is ever going to be captured in a compelling way on screen? I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, we, we have a film uh, in the museum that was wonderfully put together by NASA Goddard, which is right down the street. And they were actually able to talk about the quantum encryption parts that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. Uh, but even in that case, they just kind of showed the machines they were working on and they kind of talked about yeah. the fact. I mean, one of the, the great thing about quantum encryption is that there's something called the no clones theory or quantum entanglements, mm-hmm. kind of the fancy way of saying that you will always know if somebody's trying to steal your information. Mm-hmm. That's the cool thing yeah. about it, right? Yeah. Because the minute someone tries to grab it, changes it. You'll know, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's kind of the holy grail, right? The idea is, is, yeah, you might not be able to protect this information, but you'll know it's being attacked, right? Which is the, kind of the first step. Yeah. I guess you could show that, maybe. I just don't know how. I mean, it really... It, most of the movies that dealt with cyber in the last 20 years has been like some nerdy guy at a computer kind of banging away at the uh-huh. computer and all like nine screens. And yeah. I, I know people are better than me at that, but you don't need more than like two... Um, <laughs> it, that's how they've shown it. They've just kind of thrown out a bunch of jargon and you're just supposed to take it, you know, uh, take it at their word for it, that they're doing something cybery. Yeah. I think they're going to have to evolve from that because I think people are starting to kind of get a little bit of this. And, and even the most basic, certainly the young people today, kids these days, yeah. the younger people who are in middle school and high school and in college that mm-hmm. grew up during this era are going to have a better understanding of it. So they're not going to be able to kind of half-ass their way through, mm-hmm. you know, just throwing out some terminology and buzzwords and think that people are going to be like, that doesn't make any sense. That person just said, for my generation, it can say whatever the hell you want, right? Yeah. And I'll be like, we'll get away with it. whatever. Uh, but I think they're going to have to start taking it more seriously about how, how accurate it is because people are just much more educated about it from an early age. Yeah. Do you think that, and maybe this is the goal of all this, do you think that, learning the history through the museum here primarily and then further exploration learning the history can inspire people to tell better stories well you know i'm a historian so i think of obviously learning the history can make you do all sorts of things better you know whiter teeth and shinier hair and all those so maybe the next great movie about cryptology is someone who visits the museum and is inspired by exactly one of these artifacts right that's exactly no and and i think that you know We've learned through museums. We've learned through well-done movies about things. We've learned through uh, other forms of popular culture that aren't movie-based, like streaming services and things like that, or mm-hmm. miniseries, Band of Brothers, or other things. We've learned you can do it right. Mm. It can be done. Mm-hmm. Complicated issues can be explained. I mean, and reach a receptive audience. Right, and be really entertaining at yeah. the same time. I mean, uh, you know, I think the, the first hint of this is you know, when Carl Sagan did Cosmos, he convinced people somehow to let him talk about star systems and nebula and all these other things he's like look people will like it and like i don't know and then it became huge and now it's been redone with neil degrasse tyson and and so that's as complicated as anything right you're talking about physics at a level that just most people don't get but he found a way to bring it to the people because he was given time to let it cook and i think that's where movies don't have that i think Mm -hmm. is you don't have the time you got to jump right in you got to get to the action and go from there when you're dealing with breaking codes, breaking ciphers, when you're dealing with intelligence, period, mm-hmm. I think that you you run into a real problem with 
having to rush things. Because even even something as simple as human intelligence, even something as simple as what the CIA people do, because they, they <laughs> as simple as simple, right? I mean, they, you can you want to give them two things things that are too complicated. Just doing a surveillance detection run mm. is a twelve hour operation if you're inside Moscow in the 1980s, right? It's not just changing from one cab and throwing a hat on. How do you show that, right? Well, you could yeah. show that in a miniseries. You could show that in a longer form. But if you do it in a movie and it looks like it's just a quick change, then you lose everything mm-hmm. about it, right? You lose right. how difficult yeah. how difficult it is to operate in Moscow in the 1980s, right? Where literally your entire day mm-hmm. is spent losing the KGB. Mm-hmm. I think that it can't, I think cryptology is similar to that because there is a level of understanding that I think you need to build within your public in order for them to really understand the yeah. story and what you're doing. And and it's not just you want them to know more. It's that you want to actually get the big picture. Mm-hmm. One thing about Imitation Game that I think I walked away from it going, great, more people will know Alan Turing, but more people will think how it was easy to break Enigma. Right. And it was insanely difficult to break Enigma. This was not something that was done in two hours. This was something that was done over years. And it wasn't just Turing and four other guys mm-hmm. sitting in a room going, Eureka, Heil Hitler, <laughs> we found it. It was thousands of people yeah. working on this. Um, to me, that it does a huge disservice to the people working in this field and, and to the public, right? Because if you want the public to understand things and the public wants to understand things, you got to present it to them in a way uh, that is not dumbed down. Well, if nothing else, the perfect six hour movie about some aspect of cryptology would have a, a great audience in central Maryland, right? The theaters yes. around here <laughs> might appreciate it if it's well done and accurate. Uh, we close out our conversations on chatter by pulling into our random chatter box and getting a question. So yours is, <laughs> Vince, who played the best James Bond? Oof, this is so I'm so, I'm so uh, recency bias on this one. I'm mm. a Daniel Craig fan. Why? Uh, I, to me, I I and I have said this before to people is the guy I meet in a dark alley. If I ever thought from the books, mm-hmm. reading about James Bond in the books, right. I would be afraid to meet James Bond in a dark alley because I'd be worried he was going to kick my ass. Right, and I'm not a small dude. Daniel Craig is the one guy I probably would worry about mm-hmm. putting up a pretty vicious fight. Now, Connery, his problem was the quips. I couldn't get over the quips, the the yeah. this, the, the tongue in cheek. Always whatever. the one-liner. Always the, the one-liner just took away kind of the menacing part of him. Mm-hmm. I think that Daniel Craig was menacing. I think that that kind of, that to me made him the best Bond. Because mm-hmm. again, if you read the books. He's not a charming character he's not. in many ways. He's he is a brute dark. force dark guy. Yeah. He, he, much in the same way that Jack Ryan was Tom Clancy's alter ego, he wanted to be Jack Ryan. Mm-hmm. In many ways, the Bond was everything Ian Fleming was. Ian Fleming was the debonair, suave intelligence analyst, right? Bond was the blunt force weapon. It's the way the books that are kind of design him. Yeah. Um, that to me is Daniel Craig. Hmm. Uh, maybe if I had met Connery in his youth when he was, you know, Mr. Olympia, like mm-hmm. the jacked out of his gourd. But <laughs> I, you know, maybe it would have been Lazenby if he had gotten the chance to do to actually develop movies. Right. Because he certainly had the he body had. for it. Like he was, he yeah. still is a very large man. Uh, but Craig is really the person that I think that I, I I would be bloodied in a fight. You know, I'm pretty I'm pretty sure he'd get some good punches in. That's I never visual. saw that about Timothy Dalton. Certainly not Roger Moore. Mm-hmm. Pierce Brosnan was too pretty. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, Connery with the quips. You know, Connery was again a very strong man, but just the quips just threw me off. He just I couldn't take right. him seriously. Right. So yeah, it's Craig. All right, we'll leave it there. Uh, Vince, thanks for walking us through the museum. Thanks for getting people interested in cryptology. And thanks for talking with me on Chatter. Yeah, thanks for coming out. We're trying to let everybody know we're here and we're open. It's been two and a half very, very boring years of not being (laughs) open to the public. So we're happy to have people back. Thanks. That was Chatter, a production of Lawfare and Goat Rodeo. Please subscribe to the podcast and find us on Twitter at That Was Chatter.